we are bombarded by news of cancer epidemics. Many have cancer. Many know someone who has been frozen in their tracks by a cancer diagnosis. But the news is better than it seems, and that's what I hope to explain to you today. Since the 1950s, many cancers have increased. Breast, brain, kidney, prostate has tripled, thyroid and melanoma skin cancers have exploded. And so, like some of these folks who are frozen among the crowds, rushing through New York's Grand Central, more and more of us may also become frozen in our tracks by cancer. That is a grim picture, but there is good news. Often, these are harmless cancers. I'm a physician who would like to spare you the harmful treatment of harmless cancers. Okay, as a radiologist and an advocate, I'd like to spare you the anguish of my own family's ordeal. On Memorial Day in 2016, my family gathered in the Green Mountains. We were celebrating my daughter's birthday. Everyone was happy. We were relaxing. My husband, Bernie, played some tennis. And then he developed back pain, excruciating back pain, and literally overnight, unexplained paralysis. Now, I've been an army doctor, a witness to mass casualty. I've seen tragedies I would rather forget during my medical career. But this tragedy was unbearably brutal. None of the brilliant doctors at the best hospitals knew what the heck was going on. And for five months, in five hospitals, in three states, I watched as Bernie underwent unnecessary procedures, often with utter disregard for his dignity, ravaging our finances, anguishing our adult children. Now, medicine can be brilliant. It can be miraculous. But suffering can come even from well-intentioned overtreatment. And I hope that you and your loved ones will never suffer unnecessarily. The harm harmful treatment of harmless cancers is common, and it can cause psychological distress, unnecessary surgery, the complications from treatment, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, which may outweigh the benefits, and incredible expense. The overtreatment of breast cancer alone is estimated at $4 billion per year. The Human Genome Project cost a mere $2.7 billion. Now, this too is a grim picture, but there is, again, good news. Cancer mortality has dropped 20% in the last 20 years. How can that be? We've got rampant epidemics and plummeting mortality. Well, the explanation is partially the substantial improvement in cancer care and treatment, but it is largely the unearthing of harmless cancers. Epidemics of things we call cancer but which act benign. The best evidence for harmless cancer comes from autopsy studies of people who have died from other causes. And the large reservoirs of harmless cancers which increase as we age. And the classic case is prostate. Autopsy studies first demonstrate harmless prostate cancers in men in their 20s. They're more common in the 40s, and they are virtually a normal finding in the elderly. Autopsy studies estimate silent, harmless cancers stowing away in the prostate of more than 60% of men over 70, in the breast of up to 39% of women, in the thyroid of almost every adult and in the pancreas, the kidney, the 
endo the endometrium. Because the harmless cancers identified only at autopsy far outweigh your risk of a harmful cancer. That's important. Your lifetime risk of a harmful cancer is far less than the certainty of a silent, harmless cancer. Because cancers are not all alike. Cancers are a motley crew. Some are like pirates, deadly, unstoppable, ravage the ship. Some are like masked mutineers, threatening cancers that treatment may contain or cure. And most are like harmless stowaways, which hide silently and pose no threat. Now, this became personal for me when two close friends developed the same rare pancreatic islet cell tumor as did Steve Jobs. My friend Matt wrote about his situation in Slate, and he explains that he had a large tumor, a golf ball-sized tumor, found late by pure luck on a CAT scan for appendicitis. Now, in the 10 years since, Matt has started a family and a pancreatic cancer charity with his surgeon, John Cameron. Matt appears to have had a stowaway. My friend Sung, a music doctoral candidate, had no such luck. Sung was entirely well at our dinner, June 2014, just before she jetted home to Korea for the summer. In October, I awoke to an email announcing her untimely death. Now, I dearly miss Sung, who appears to have had a pirate. Steve Jobs, who reportedly deferred treatment, may have had a masked mutineer that ignored took his life. But despite this motley crew, public health messages reinforce our view that early detection is the key to survival. What I'm trying to explain is that your survival may depend instead on your tumor's biology rather than the point at which it is found. Why now? Why now have we unearthed epidemics of harmless cancers? Screening and scanning. The signing of the National Cancer Act by President Nixon in 1971 began the war against cancer and organized screening. Radiologic scanning continually improves, and it has led to explosions of harmless cancers on scans ordered for other reasons. And we see this in the thyroid of 67% of adults, in the lungs of 50% of smokers, in high percentages of the adult kidney, liver, and pancreas. The harder you look by scanning and screening, the more harmless cancers you find. And there's more evidence. Take a look at this National Cancer Institute data from 1975 to 2005. That's the first 30 years the data was available. Thyroid cancer incidence in yellow more than doubled. Death rates in red are stable because these are largely incidental and harmless thyroid cancers on scans ordered for other reasons. And we see the same trend for, for melanoma, for kidney cancer, during that 30-year period, increased incidence, stable death rates. Now, this is mind-blowing. The thyroid cancer experience in Korea shows that the incidence increased 15-fold during the interval between 1999 and 2011 after the initiation of screening. But the death rates in red are stable. So what I am trying to show you is that the incidental cancers in the U.S. and the screen-detected lesions in Korea are the mildest forms of disease. 
and they are the source of the epidemics of harmless cancers. But this is poorly understood by the public, by policymakers, by physicians, and it drives overtreatment. Also poorly understood are, medi are medical probabilities, what I've called statistical magic tricks, which also drive this culture of testing more, finding more, treating more. Now, I've summarized three examples. Hang in, a few stats. The first is false positives. A false positive test says you have a disease when you don't. Test yourself. How likely is breast cancer in a 40-year-old with a positive mammogram? Only 8.3%. How can that be? Well, of 10,000 40-year-olds, 100 will have breast cancer. The remainder will not. Okay? Of those with breast cancer, 90% or 90 women will have a true positive mammogram. 10% of those without breast cancer, 990 women, will have a false positive mammogram. You see where this is going. Of 1,080 positive tests, 990 will be false positive, and they will lead to additional imaging biopsies, surgery, perhaps the harmful treatment of a harmless cancer. Because a 40-year-old woman with a positive mammogram has a 92% chance of not having breast cancer. If the disease is rare, most positive screening tests will be false positive. It's counterintuitive, and it is true. Okay. The second poorly understood statistical magic trick is relative risk. This exaggerates the effect of a test or treatment, and it is reported as a percentage. For example, CAT scan screening of lung cancers decreases deaths in smokers by 16%, which, in absolute terms, is 0.05 lives saved per thousand screened. Let me walk you through that. CAT scan screening will decrease deaths from 21 per thousand to 18 per thousand, three fewer deaths, which is a 16% relative risk reduction. Because three is 16% of 21. But in absolute terms, that is three lives saved per thousand over six years, 0.05 lives saved per thousand per year. So rel relative risk will exaggerate the benefit, and it underreports the harms, biopsies, surgeries, which may outweigh the benefit. Again, it is counterintuitive, but it is true. Okay, one more. Sorry. Five-year survival creates the false impression that lives have been saved. Take two patients whose cancer starts in 2008. Okay. One patient is diagnosed when he develops symptoms in 2016. He lives for two years. Our second patient is diagnosed when screened in 2010, okay, and he lives for eight years with the awareness, the questionable gift of awareness of a terminal illness. He has an improved five-year survival, although screening has made no difference in the length of his life. It's counterintuitive, but it is true. So my objective is clear, to make you aware of the evolution in our understanding of cancer statistics, of cancer probabilities. To make you aware that these statistical magic tricks, 
false positive, relative risk, five-year survival, and the motley crew of cancers, though counterintuitive, are true. And because they are poorly understood, they contribute to the well-intentioned but harmful treatment of harmless cancers. Okay? So, in summary, if you are faced with the shattering news of cancer diagnosis, I hope that you now can take an emotional step back. Ask for the facts in absolute terms. Review a decision aid which outlines the harms and benefits, such as this. Or a decision aid, a graphical decision aid, which explains that for per one life saved, perhaps 136 will be harmed by a complication from the treatment. In this way, you can make an objective choice based upon your own values, as my husband Bernie and I did. You may choose to wait and see. You may seek personalized cancer care. You may opt to undergo modified screening or participate in a research protocol. I hope that you will now find yourself back among the ordinary folks, no longer frozen in your tracks and getting back to living. Thank you.